Brought to you by Wikivide Documentaries. Mir. Mir was a space station that operated in low Earth orbit from 1986 to 2001, operated by the Soviet Union and later by Russia. Mir was the first modular space station and was assembled in orbit from 1986 to 1996. It had a greater mass than any previous spacecraft. At the time it was the largest artificial satellite in orbit, succeeded by the International Space Station after Mir's orbit decayed. The station served as a microgravity research laboratory in which crews conducted experiments in biology, human biology, physics, astronomy, meteorology and spacecraft systems with the goal of developing technologies required for permanent occupation of space. Mir was the first continuously inhabited long-term research station in orbit and held the record for the longest continuous human presence in space, at 3,644 days, until it was surpassed by the ISS on 23 October 2010. It holds the record for the longest single human spaceflight, with Valery Polyakov spending 437 days and 18 hours on the station between 1994 and 1995. Mir was occupied for a total of 12 and a half years out of its 15-year lifespan, having the capacity to support a resident crew of three or larger crews for short visits. Following the success of the Salute program, Mir represented the next stage in the Soviet Union space station program. The first module of the station, known as the core module or base block, was launched in 1986 and followed by six further modules. Proton rockets were used to launch all of its components except for the docking module, which was installed by a U.S. Space Shuttle mission STS-74 in 1995. When complete, the station consisted of seven pressurized modules and several unpressurized components. Power was provided by several photovoltaic arrays attached directly to the modules. The station was maintained at an orbit between 296 km and 421 km altitude and travelled at an average speed of 27,700 km per hour, completing 15.7 orbits per day. The station was launched as part of the Soviet Union's manned spaceflight program effort to maintain a long-term research outpost in space, and following the collapse of the USSR, was operated by the new Russian Federal Space Agency. As a result, most of the station's occupants were Soviet. Through international collaborations such as the Intercosmos, Euromir and Shuttlemir programs, the station was made accessible to space travelers from several Asian, European and North American nations. Mir was deorbited in March 2001 after funding was cut off. The cost of the Mir program was estimated by former RKA General Director Yuri Koptev in 2001 as $4.2 billion over its lifetime. Origins Mir was authorized on a 17 February 1976 decree to design an improved model of the Salute DOS 17K space stations. Four Salute space stations had been launched since 1971, with three more being launched during Mir's development. It was planned that the station's core module would be equipped with a total of four docking ports, two at either end of the station as with the Salute stations, and an additional two ports on either side of a docking sphere at the front of the station to enable further modules to expand the station's capabilities. By August 1978, this had evolved to the final configuration of one aft port and five ports in a spherical compartment at the forward end of the station. It was originally planned that the ports would connect to 7.5 tons modules derived from the Soyuz spacecraft. These modules would have used a Soyuz propulsion module, as in Soyuz and Progress, and the descent and orbital modules would have been replaced with a long laboratory module. Following a February 1979 governmental resolution, the program was consolidated with Vladimir Shulomais manned Almaz military space station program. The docking ports were reinforced to accommodate 20 tons space station modules based on the TKS spacecraft. NPO Energy was responsible for the overall space station, with work subcontracted to KB Salute, due to ongoing work on the Energia rocket and Salute 7, Soyuz T, and Progress spacecraft. KB Salute began work in 1979, and drawings were released in 1982 and 1983. New systems incorporated into the station included the Salute 5B digital flight control computer and Girodan flywheels. Kerr's automatic rendezvous system, 
Luch satellite communication system, electron oxygen generators, and Vos tube carbon dioxide scrubbers. By early 1984, Work on Mir had halted while all resources were being put into the Buran program in order to prepare the Buran spacecraft for flight testing. Funding resumed in early 1984 when Valentin Glushko was ordered by the Central Committee Secretary for Space and Defense to orbit Mir by early 1986, in time for the 27th Communist Party Congress. It was clear that the planned processing flow could not be followed and still meet the 1986 launch date. It was decided on Cosmonauts Day 1985 to ship the flight model of the base block to the Baikonur Cosmodrome, and conduct the system's testing and integration there. The module arrived at the launch site on 6 May, with 1,100 of 2,500 cables requiring rework based on the results of tests to the ground test model at Karunichev. In October, the base block was rolled outside its cleanroom to carry out communications tests. The first launch attempt on 16 February 1986 was scrubbed, when the spacecraft communications failed, but the second launch attempt, on 19 February 1986 at 21.28.23 UTC, was successful, meeting the political deadline. Assembly The orbital assembly of Mir began on February 19, 1986 with the launch of the Proton-K rocket, Four of the six modules which were later added followed the same sequence to be added to the main Mir complex. Firstly, the module would be launched independently on its own Proton K and chase the station automatically. It would then dock to the forward docking port on the core module's docking node. Then extend its LIAPA arm to mate with a fixture on the node's exterior. The arm would then lift the module away from the forward docking port and rotate it onto the radial port where it was to mate before lowering it to dock. The node was equipped with only two Kona strokes, which were required for dockings. This meant that, prior to the arrival of each new module, the node would have to be depressurized to allow spacewalking cosmonauts to manually relocate the drogue to the next port to be occupied. The other two expansion modules, Kvant 1 in 1987 and the docking module in 1995, followed different procedures. Kvant 1, having Unlike the four modules mentioned above, no engines of its own was launched attached to a tug based on the TKS spacecraft which delivered the module to the aft end of the core module instead of the docking node. Once hard docking had been achieved, the tug undocked and deorbited itself. The docking module, meanwhile, was launched aboard during STS-74 and mated to the orbiter's orbiter docking system. Atlantis then docked via the module to Crystal then left the module behind, when it undocked later in the mission. Various other external components, including three truss structures, several experiments, and other unpressurized elements were also mounted to the exterior of the station by cosmonauts conducting a total of 80 space walks over the course of the station's history. The station's assembly marked the beginning of the third generation of space station design, being the first to consist of more than one primary spacecraft. First-generation stations such as Salute 1 and Skylab had monolithic designs, consisting of one module with no resupply capability. The second-generation stations Salute 6 and Salute 7 comprised a monolithic station, with two ports to allow consumables to be replenished by cargo spacecraft such as Progress. The capability of Mir to be expanded with add-on modules meant that each could be designed with a specific purpose in mind, thus eliminating the need to install all the station's equipment in one module. Pressurized modules In its completed configuration, the space station consisted of seven different modules, each launched into orbit separately, over a period of ten years by either Proton-K rockets or unpressurized elements. In addition to the pressurized modules, Mir featured several external components. The largest component was the Sofora Gerda, a large scaffolding-like structure consisting of 20 segments which, when assembled, projected 14 meters from its mount on Kvant 1. A self-contained thruster block, the VDU, was mounted on the end of Sofora and was used to augment the roll control thrusters on the core module. The VDU's increased distance from Mir's axis allowed an 85% decrease in fuel consumption, reducing the amount of propellant required to orient the station. 
A second girda, Rapana, was mounted aft of Sophora on Kvant 1. This girda, a small prototype of a structure intended to be used on Mir 2 to hold large parabolic dishes away from the main station structure, was 5 meters long and used as a mounting point for externally mounted exposure experiments to assist in moving objects around the exterior of the station during EVAs. Mir featured two Strela cargo cranes mounted to the sides of the core module, used for moving spacewalking cosmonauts and parts. The cranes consisted of telescopic poles assembled in sections which measured around 6 feet when collapsed, but, when extended using a hand crank were 46 feet long, meaning that all of the station's modules could easily be accessed during spacewalks. Each module was fitted with external components specific to the experiments that were carried out within that module, the most obvious being the Travers antenna mounted to Proroda. This synthetic aperture radar consisted of a large dish-like framework mounted outside the module, with associated equipment within, used, for Earth observations experiments, as was most of the other equipment on Proroda including various radiometers and scan platforms. Kravant 2 also featured several scan platforms and was fitted with a mounting bracket to which the cosmonaut maneuvering unit, or a car, was mated. This backpack was designed to assist cosmonauts in moving around the station and the planned Buran in a manner similar to the US manned maneuvering unit, but it was only used once. During EO5, in addition to module-specific equipment, Kravant 2, Crystal, Spectre, and Proroda were each equipped with one Lyapa arm, a robotic arm which, after the module had docked to the core module's forward port, grappled one of two fixtures positioned on the core module's docking node. The arriving module's docking probe was then retracted, and the arm raised the module so that it could be pivoted 90 degrees for docking to one of the four radial docking ports. Power Supply Photovoltaic Arrays Powered Mir the station used a 28-volt DC supply which provided 5, 10, 20 and 50 amp taps. When the station was illuminated by sunlight, several solar arrays mounted on the pressurized modules provided power to Mir systems, and charged the nickel-cadmium storage batteries installed throughout the station. The arrays rotated in only one degree of freedom over a 180 degrees arc, and tracked the sun using sun sensors and motors installed in the array mounts. The station itself also had to be oriented, to ensure optimum illumination of the arrays. When the station's or sky sensor detected that Mir had entered Earth's shadow, the arrays were rotated, to the optimum angle predicted for reacquiring the sun once the station passed out of the shadow. The batteries, each of 60 R capacity, were then used to power the station until the arrays recovered their maximum output on the day side of Earth. The solar arrays themselves were launched and installed over a period of 11 years, more slowly than originally planned, with the station continually suffering from a shortage of power as a result. The first two arrays, each 38 square meters in area, were launched on the core module, and together provided a total of 9 kilowatts of power. A third, dorsal panel was launched on Kvant 1, and mounted on the core module in 1987, providing a further 2 kilowatts from a 22 square meters area. Kvant 2, launched in 1989, provided two 10 meters long panels which supplied 3.5 kilowatts each, whilst Crystal was launched with two collapsible, 15 meters long arrays which were intended to be moved to Kvant 1 and installed on mounts which were attached during a spacewalk by the EO-8 crew in 1991. This relocation was begun in 1995, when the panels were attracted and the left panel installed on Kvant 1. By this time all the arrays had degraded and were supplying much less power. To rectify this, Spectre, which had initially been designed to carry two arrays, was modified to hold four, providing a total of 126 square meters of array, with a 16 kilowatts supply. Two further arrays were flown to the station on board that during STS-74, carried on the docking module. The first of these, the Mir Cooperative Solar Array consisted of American photovoltaic cells mounted on a Russian frame. It was installed on the unoccupied mount on Kvant 1 in May 1996 and was connected to the socket that had previously been occupied by the core module's dorsal panel, which was by this point barely supplying 1 kilowatt. The other panel, originally intended to be launched on Proroda, replaced the crystal panel on Kvant 1 in November 1997 
completing the station's electrical system. Orbit control Mir was maintained in a near-circular orbit with an average perigee of 354 km and an average apogee of 374 km, traveling at an average speed of 27,700 km per hour and completing 15.7 orbits per day. As the station constantly lost altitude, because of the slight atmospheric drag, it needed to be boosted to a higher altitude several times each year. This boost was generally performed by Progress resupply vessels, although during the Shuttle Mir program the task was performed by U.S. space shuttles, and, prior to the arrival of Gvant-1, the engines on the core module could also accomplish the task. The attitude of the station was independently determined by a set of externally mounted sun, star and horizon sensors. Attitude information was conveyed between updates by rate sensors. Attitude control was maintained by a combination of two mechanisms. In order to hold a set attitude, a system of 12 control moment gyroscopes rotating at 10,000 revolutions per minute kept the station oriented, six SMGs being located in each of the Kvant 1 and Kvant 2 modules. When the attitude of the station needed to be changed, the gyrodans were disengaged. Thrusters were used to attain the new attitude and the SMGs were re-engaged. This was done fairly regularly depending on experimental needs. For instance, Earth or astronomical observations required that the instrument recording images be continuously aimed at the target, and so the station was oriented to make this possible. Conversely, materials processing experiments required the minimization of movement on board the station and so Mia would be oriented in a gravity gradient attitude for stability. Prior to the arrival of the modules containing these gyrodynes, the station's attitude was controlled using thrusters located on the core module alone, and, in an emergency, the thrusters on docked Soyuz spacecraft could be used to maintain the station's orientation. Communications Radio communications provided telemetry and scientific data links between Mir and the RKA Mission Control Center. Radio links were also used during rendezvous and docking procedures and for audio and video communication between crew members, flight controllers and family members. As a result, Mir was equipped with several communication systems used for different purposes. The station communicated directly with the ground via the Lyra antenna mounted to the core module. The Lyra antenna also had the capability to use the Luch data relay satellite system and the network of Soviet tracking ships deployed in various locations around the world. UHF radio was used by cosmonauts conducting EVAs. UHF was also employed by other spacecraft that docked to or undocked from the station, such as Soyuz, Progress, and the Space Shuttle, in order to receive commands from the T's up and Mir crew members via the Daru system. Microgravity At Mir's orbital altitude, the force of Earth's gravity was 88% of sea level gravity, while the constant free fall of the station offered a perceived sensation of weightlessness. The onboard environment was not one of weightlessness or zero gravity. The environment was often described as microgravity. This state of perceived weightlessness was not perfect, being disturbed by five separate effects. Life support Mir's environmental control and life support system provided or controlled atmospheric pressure, fire detection, oxygen levels, waste management, and water supply. The highest priority for the ECLS was the station's atmosphere, but the system also collected, processed, and stored waste, and water produced and used by the crew, a process that recycles fluid from the sink, toilet, and condensation from the air. The electron system generated oxygen bottled oxygen and solid fuel oxygen generation canisters, a system known as VECA, provided backup. Carbon dioxide was removed from the air by the Vosjuk system. Other byproducts of human metabolism, such as methane from the intestines and ammonia from sweat, were removed by activated charcoal filters. Similar systems are presently used on the International Space Station. The atmosphere on Mir was similar to Earth's. Normal air pressure on the station was 101.3 kilopascals. The same as at sea level on Earth, an Earth-like atmosphere offers benefits for crew comfort, and is much safer than the alternative, a pure oxygen atmosphere.
because of increased fire risks such as occurred with Apollo 1. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?